My topic is an extension of what we've been dealing with, the Beatitudes. And we've come to the third Beatitude, but the fourth message. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I want to basically talk about the key to our inheritance. Now, if you go back to the original creation, when God created man and woman, He called them Adam. They were male and female. And He told them that they were to do certain things. And it has to do with this whole thing of inheritance, possession. Genesis 1, 28. But let me read from verse 24. Genesis 1, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. In certain ways, God just spoke things into existence. He says, uh, let the earth bring forth living creatures. But when he deals with man, it's quite different. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Notice the plurality there. After our likeness. And let them, plurality again, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. In God's image. What does that mean? An exact replica of God? Of course not. Is it is a physical resemblance? No, there is no physical resemblance because God says you never saw any similitude. Don't try and imagine what I'm like. So what does it say in his own image? In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. It must have to do with the fact that man has a will. I won't say free will, because you've probably heard me on this. I don't think man has free will. I think he has freedom of choice. That's a different thing. As I've tried to explain, and I hope most of you have got it, free will really means that whatever you will comes to pass. Only God has free will. We don't have free will. Only God has free will. Everything that he wills comes to pass. That's free will. But we have freedom of choice. God has elected that we should have freedom of choice. So God created man in his own image. And in that regard, we are in the image of God. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now that doesn't mean that in man there are certain female tendencies and certain male tendencies. It's basically saying that God made man and woman different. Of course, we're blurring the genders now, aren't we? In every regard. There's going to be a total rebellion against God, ultimately, and it's building up very, very much. Man and woman are equal, but they're different. It's a good article written by Zach Poonan. He's a good writer, very practical and um, to the point. He uh, is writing on the characteristics of a virtuous wife. He says, when God made Eve, it was in order that she might be a helper suitable for man, Genesis 2.18. The glory of this ministry, woman's ministry, is seen when we notice that the title of Helper is what Jesus used to refer to the Holy Spirit as well. So a woman 
serves an incredible ministry. As the Holy Spirit invisibly and silently yet powerfully helps the believer, even so the woman was created to help the man. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is behind the scenes. So is the woman to be. A helper. It's a very good article. I'm not going to read it all. I'm sure some of you may not agree. <laughs> but read it and consider it. I think it's a powerful thing. I think in the church we've, we've sidestepped and minimized the real ministry of women, particularly wives, of godly men, godly pastors, by projecting the woman into the forefront, platform, and so on. My mother was a good preacher, and I, I, I learned very, very much from her. But she always operated under the authority of my father. My father was the pastor always. And there's something about this. He said, I will make a woman to help you. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Man was not given dominion over other men. This is one of the big problems, of course, of our day, in the governments of the world. When uh, we're losing our nationalism in, in, the, in the global setting, and, and, you know, countries are coming to the point very fast where they will not be able to make their own laws. It, it's outside of our province. And it's all to do with man's desire to have dominion over other men. The Bible never intended that that should be so, but that man would have dominion over the creatures and over the earth and control the earth, which, of course, is gotten out of control, and control the animal life within it, but not control humans. The first promise made by God, or first instruction rather, was not to multiply. We're pretty good at that. <laughs> they tell me what a, how many billion now in the world, pretty, pretty high amount. And I, I don't know how they count them. but <laughs> We're good at multiplying, but God said the first command was, be fruitful. You can multiply. You can have kids, loads of kids. It can be a curse to you. But if you follow God's way, you will be fruitful and multiply. Now what I've discovered is that the New Testament actually supplies the missing link. It didn't seem to happen in the Old Testament. Man lost dominion because he disobeyed God. The woman ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and man was encouraged by her to do the same. And as a result, sin entered into the world. And so, man's instruction, God's commission, was never fulfilled. Be fruitful. When you come to the New Testament, Jesus tells us how to be fruitful. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Every branch in me that bears fruit... He actually purges to bring forth more fruit because the purpose is to be fruitful. And basically what he says in that analogy of the vine is that apart from me, you cannot be fruitful. So we become fruitful only in him. And the same really in respect of this matter of inheritance. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over land, over sea, over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Have dominion. But man lost dominion as soon as he disobeyed God. And so, he lost the ability to inherit. Man's inheritance is outlined for us in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse 27 so God created man in his image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Early in the Garden of Eden, rebellion set in. And it's taken really the whole of the spread of civilization for that rebellion to find its ultimate expression. And one of the final things is the mixing of the genders. So that man no longer performs his function and woman no longer performs her function. There is a blending. And we come to the point now where you have women marrying women and men marrying men, which was totally and absolutely contrary to God's intention. It's the final expression of rebellion against Almighty God. It's the fist shaken in the face of all God Almighty says, I'll dethrone you. But thank God, friends, freedom wears a crown. And Jesus Christ is not about to abdicate. Verse 28, and God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful. Okay, Jesus comes and he tells us how to be fruitful. And multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. He promised inheritance. Jesus comes along and tells us how we can get that inheritance. As we have said, the Beatitudes were given not to the crowd. It doesn't make sense if you say that Jesus was teaching the multitude. And I'll show you in a minute three reasons why I don't think Jesus was doing that. He was teaching the principles of the kingdom. He was training the twelve. He was dealing in the church setting. And so you'll see that these beatitudes, as we have suggested, there are character traits, there is conduct, and there is consequence. Nine Beatitudes, actually. We've said this before, and we'll summarize it again at the end of this message. The first characteristic is humility. Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Or one rendering is, happy are they that rate themselves insignificant. Men and women always want to be significant. But Jesus said, 
the process is to consider yourself insignificant. And we've explained that in the first message and repeated it, I guess, in the second and third message and repeat it again here very quickly. When the disciples say, who's going to be the greatest? We want significance. He took a child and said in the midst and said, unless you become as a little child, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who rate themselves insignificant. Happy are those. It starts with the first characteristic, humility. Now these beatitudes all flow one from the other. It starts with that one, and he's talking to the people in the kingdom. Not to those out there, although there are those who eavesdrop and listen, and they can benefit from it. They can apply it to themselves. But primarily, it's directed at the church. It's directed towards the people of God. So, Jesus said, you've come into the kingdom now, Happy are you if you rate yourself insignificant. In fact, that's the entrance. You won't get into the kingdom unless you rate yourself insignificant. That's why no proud person ever gets saved. You cannot get saved if you're proud. That pride has to be dealt with. The second characteristic is meekness, the one that we're considering today. Meekness. Blessed or happy are the meek, for they shall inherit. God said to man and woman, I want you to inherit. I want you to possess the world. I want you to subdue the world. I want you to have dominion over the world and everything in the world. And yet they failed. They failed mainly because they lacked meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. We'll have a look in a moment at what meekness really is. The third characteristic is purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's another reason why he couldn't be talking to the world in general. He couldn't be talking to the multitude. He must be talking to his disciples. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see, they shall see God. They will become visionaries. They will, they will have their eyes open. They will see something that other people do not see. So there are three character traits. Now, out of what we are is what we do. Being produces action. That's why he always starts with a characteristic. But then it flows on into conduct. And as we saw a couple of weeks on the trot, blessed are those that mourn. That's something that you do. He's talking about mourning for your sin. You cannot mourn for your sin unless you rate yourself insignificant. So the characteristic produces the consequent conduct. And so what you have in these, in these, in these Beatitudes is a characteristic leading to a conduct, being leading to action, and then action shaping character, molding character, forming it. And so the one leads to the other. Character, conduct, consequence. Every man and every woman will say, Lord, well, when I've done all that, what, what do I get? What's the consequence? Blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. You have to retain those beatitudes all the way through. Rating yourself insignificant and rating him everything. And then the consequence doesn't affect you a great deal. The whole issue is that Jesus Christ may be glorified. Not that I will be benefited. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write a book. I think I'm gradually getting it past my editors. <laughs> my wife is the final hurdle. <laughs> and we're working through it, aren't we, love? <laughs> and I've, <laughs> I've benefited a great deal from the various ones. Brother uh, Alan and Clarice, Sister Clarice, they're not with us this morning. They, they've been a tremendous help in uh, putting things together and, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, but um, what, what, what we see is that really uh, the book is called Who is Jesus? Now Jesus is everything. He's not everyone, but he's everything. And when we allow him to wear the crown in our lives, then all will be well. It doesn't matter if we become sick. It doesn't matter if we become poor. Those things are incidental. Being leads to doing. When we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't rate ourselves significant. We rate him as being the significant one. William Burton's adage in life, a man who founded a thousand church in Belgium, Congo, during the difficult times there, lived by a motto, I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing at all, Jesus said. So that being leads to doing. Poverty of spirit le leads to mourning for sin. Mourning for sin is part of the entrance into the kingdom. But once you have gotten into the kingdom, you realize the enormity of your sin. I mean, I've, I've talked to some of our young people, and, and they, they, they've said we didn't realize the vileness of ourselves. That's the revelation of God. God reveals our emptiness and our vileness, and we mourn. For our sins. Repentance is not just an act. Repentance is a condition. It starts with an act. But it's a condition. And it's a lifelong attitude. So that we are constantly expressing our dependence upon God. Poverty of spirit leads to mourning for sin. Mourning for sin leads to meekness of mind. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Do you want to inherit? Yes, Lord, we'd like to inherit our own thing and, you know, and, you know, our, our home and, yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But really, there's something bigger than that. Mourning for sin leads to meekness of mind. And meekness of mind brings you to the point of inheritance. Somebody challenged me, you know, somebody that I highly respect. He said, I always thought that the Beatitudes were to the multitude. I said, they cannot be. And I'll give you the reason why. First of all, there is the structure of the language. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Now, this is totally different from whatever, what, what he always has done and always does in other settings. In, in a several settings, it says, When he saw the multitudes, he, he was moved with compassion, and he went towards them. But here, he turns his back on them. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And here's the sentence construction. 
and he opened his mouth and taught them. Who's the them? Clearly, it's the disciples. The very structure of the sentence, at least in our King James Version, which I think is pretty good. It was good enough for Paul, so it's good enough for you. Hmm. So the sentence structure points to it. That was good, Ben, to read from the Amplified Bible. It helps sometimes. What you have to watch with the Amplified is that it goes beyond the actual intention of some of the expressions. Not, not in your case, not in most cases, but it can do. And this is what you have to watch, particularly, of course, with regard to modern so-called translations. There are some that are dreadful, absolutely dreadful, because they cut across exactly what Jesus Christ and the Bible and God really were saying. So the sentence structure is important there. And I think it points to the fact that Jesus is directing his teaching to the disciples. The second thing that points to this is the nature of Christ's teaching. Now in Mark chapter 4, we read about Jesus teaching. And he's teaching the crowd. He began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea and the land. And he taught them many things by parables. Later, the disciples asked him, Why do you teach by parables? I think the Luke rendering, the, the synoptic gospel, is better than Mark's in the sense that it opens it more clearly to us. Let, let, let's read it. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 15. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Another fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I did a little book some time ago. I think there's some still in the book room there on understanding the kingdom parables. And it is important to understand the parables. Verse 9, And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Parables to the Christian become clear if you follow certain principles. I have taken in my book the idea that the parables hang together and relate one to the other. The sower and the seed. And the seed is never, never, never money. Sow your seed into this ministry to meet my greed. And they say, if you don't sow seed, you'll always be in need. Well, you see, it's not money. There is one passage of Scripture where it relates to money, but it has to do with giving to the poor. And we have a responsibility to give to the poor. And the Bible says if you give to the poor, it will come back to you. That's the only time in the Scripture where you have any idea of money being associated with seed. 
But here, Jesus says, the fundamental thing for you to grasp is that the seed is the Word of God. Verse 11, now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then comes the devil and takes away the Word out of their hearts. So I'm sure you'll get the, the trend. Jesus teaches parables primarily to the outside world. Of course, we can apply them to ourselves. In Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, there's not a parable. No parable. There are figures of speech, but there's no parable. Why? Because he is teaching his disciples. It's the training of the twelve. And then there's a third reason. The offer within the Beatitudes is for kingdom rule and for purity of heart. That does not apply to the outside world. It applies to those who belong to Jesus Christ. They can benefit from it, but they have to come into the kingdom first to realize it. And Jesus is really telling his disciples how they can realize these things. We used to pray a prayer. Do you remember it? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child. And I remember as a child trying to say this, and I wondered about this next line. I would always stumble over it. Pity my simplicity. I didn't know what it meant. And I remember listening to younger children as I grew older, and they stumbled over it. Sometimes they couldn't even say the words. Pity my simplicity. Suffer me to come to thee. I was interested to discover that it was actually Charles Wesley who was the author of it. And as a total song and a total poem, it's, it's very good. There are other verses. Lamb of God, I look to thee. Thou shalt my example be. Thou art gentle, meek and mild. Thou wast once a little child. Fain I would at thee be as thou art. Sorry. Fain I would be as thou art. Give me thine obedient heart. Thou art pitiful and kind. Let me have thy loving mind. Loving Jesus, gentle lamb, in thy gracious hands I am. Make me, Savior, what thou art. Live thyself within my heart. But the first verse does convey an impression which is not totally true. Gentle Jesus, meek. he can be gentle, he can be meek, and he can be mild. But look at him when he's got a whip in his hand. Look at him as he strides through the temple, and he says, take these things out. And he throws over the money, table of the money changers, and so on. Is that Jesus, meek and mild? Well, it depends to some extent what is your concept of meekness. I think this is the best definition I've come across. Meekness is perfect strength under control. Meekness is power or strength under control. All too often, meekness is confused, and this is part I'm quoting from the book, with weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. A meek person is a very strong person who has learned to harness his or her strengths by association with the one who was the meekest of men and who said, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest under your souls. Outside of Jesus Christ, the man who was noted for his meekness more than any other man, was Moses. 
And Moses led up to two million people. He wasn't weak, but he was very meek. Numbers 12 verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. This is not a human assessment, but the divine estimate of the character of Moses. Only God knows all men who are on the face of the earth at a given time. Among them all was none like Moses, who certainly was not weak, for he was a leader of more than two million people. Yet God says that he was exceptionally meek. The meekest of men then living. The incident surrounding this statement is most instructive. Miriam and Aaron, notice the order, will you? Criticized Moses over his marriage to an Ethiopian woman. Which in the light of the whole counsel of God would be hard to disagree with. Because in those days, mixed marriages were forbidden. They're not today, thank God. But they were then. And God said, because if your son marries a foreign couple's daughter, or your daughter marries a foreign couple's son, there's a danger of them being diverted and worshipping foreign gods. So really, I suppose you would have some justification for Miriam and Aaron objecting. Let's read the passage, Numbers 12, from verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And then we have our text in this particular setting. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. They three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech you. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days. And the people journeyed, not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. So be it as it may that Miriam and Aaron reverted to the Old Testament requirement about mixed marriages when they spoke about that. The point is, they went further. 
And they started to question Moses' exclusive authority in hearing and interpreting the word of God. And in so doing, they went too far and earned the rebuke of Jehovah, with Miriam becoming leprous. The judgment seemed severe, and Moses, this meekest man, sought the Lord to heal his sister, which actually did occur after a required period of exclusion from the camp. Now our Lord says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. And Moses, the meekest of all men that are upon the face of the earth, failed to inherit failed to inherit his possession. Why? Because there was a time when he stopped being meek. So it's not something that we start with, it's something that we end with. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Let me quickly go to how Moses and Aaron failed. Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13. God said, Moses, you're not going to enter the promised land. You're not going to inherit. Because you failed to sanctify me in the midst of the children of Israel. This alludes to an incident where the children of Israel were complaining again. They were always complaining. They said, we're going to die of thirst. And God said, that's all right, Moses, no problem. I can provide water. Thank God he can. He can provide water in a wilderness. Now Moses, go and stand there and speak to the rock. That alludes to another incident when the children of Israel first came out of Egypt. And I want to get through it quickly now, so I, I talked to my uncle who is 90 years of age. And he said, how are you doing? Are you preaching? And I said, yes, I preached last Sunday for about an hour. He said, oh, poor people. So I thought I'd take it to heart and try and reduce it a little bit. Moses, you failed to sanctify me in the midst of the children of Israel. Moses and Aaron made three mistakes. Read the passage when you get home and we'll get through this quickly pronounce the benediction and save you from your suffering. I almost said to my uncle, that's all right for you. I remember when you started a church again and, and your, your older brother was with you and I said, uh, very, very, very quickly, it diminished to nothing. I said, at least the people come along and hear what we've got to say. <laughs> but I didn't. Moses and Aaron made three mistakes at Kadesh. Firstly, they called God's people rebels, which was a wrong thing to do. Admittedly, as people, we may be rebellious from time to time, but no one has the right to call us rebels. Remember that preacher? Never call God's people rebels. Moses said, must we bring you water out of this rock, you rebels? He went too far. He lost his meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Moses, sorry, you can't go into the promised land. The second thing, and the failure that both Moses and Aaron and both of them were, of course, were, were um, prevented from going into the promised land. They took the credit to themselves for the miraculous provision of water. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Every work that is done in the kingdom is done by God, not by us. Must we bring you water out of this rock? There's far too much eulogizing of self in the so-called church today. Look what I've done. Look what I've achieved. Look at my 50, 55 million thousand people in the church. What have you got? Nothing. I don't have a church. I know people call it my church, but it's not. It's not. If it's my church, it doesn't belong to him. It's not. They took the credit to themselves for the miraculous provision of water. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? The third mistake, and most significant, was that Moses smote the rock twice. When all God had told him to do was speak to the rock. Now, if you go back in the history of Israel, you'll find that there was another occasion when God provided water in the wilderness. It was at a place called Rephidim, I think, which means a resting place. You have to be careful of resting places because you can easily be diverted. And on that occasion, God said to Moses, strike the rock. So there was nothing wrong with striking the rock, so long as it's only done once. It must not be repeated. Strike the rock. Why? Because as Paul tells us, that rock was Christ. And Christ, once smitten, need not be smitten again. In fact, you do a dishonor to God and to the whole of typology if you smite the rock twice. And Moses actually brought a disgrace upon the Scripture and destroyed so much of the type that was contained here. The waters of Meribah, Rephidim, meant temptation, strife, or contention. And God said to Moses, I've got the answer. The people need water. It's a necessity of life. And it's essential in the spiritual world. The only way we find water is recognizing that Christ has been smitten for us. And then, all we've got to do is speak to the rock. And water comes out. Blessed be his wonderful name. He was smitten for you. He died for you on that cruel cross. And he shed water and blood. And now, all we have to do is speak to the rock. And the water comes. Blessed are the meek. Sorry, Moses. 
the meekest man in all the world. And yet, he wasn't. There is one who is meeker than Moses. And he says, come, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest unto your soul. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Lord, we thank you that everything relates to you, not to us. We pray that you'll keep us meek before you. We pray that we will be able to guard and control our strengths and our powers. Not like Moses, who let the thing get out of hand and went beyond that which was instructed. Keep us true to you, we pray. Glorify yourself in each one of us. In Jesus' name.